this for our awesome for our asynchronous learners. Thank you so much, Laura, for being with us today. And I'm going to turn it over to you. Sure. Thanks, Karma, for joining us. Uh, my name is Laura Plinus. I work for the Sienna Corporation. We're based, um, headquartered in Hanover, Maryland. So it's right near BWI Airport. We're a global company. Uh, so we're very business to business. And we support um, AT&T, Verizon, Comcast. Uh, we provide products and services so you can get internet and be able to watch uh you know, TV shows on, on your TV with Comcast. So that's what my company does. And I help with employee communication. So our internal communications. And today um, I'm going to talk about why your words matter, you know, being an effective with your communication in a digital world. Uh, so this quote from Buddha, I really like it's whatever words we utter should be chosen with care for people who will hear them and be influenced by them for good or ill which pretty much means what you say matters, uh, where it be verbal, where it be nonverbal, how your body is communicating, uh, where it be written, the, the choices that you make and the words, how you say things, the tone, how you appear, uh, make a difference in communicating what you want people to know about you or to know about what you're, you want them to do. Because I think whenever you communicate with someone, you want to change um, something, you, their behaviors or get them to do something. And right now we're in a digital world, we're virtual. So it is very different. So this next slide is kind of what we see communication today. We're on Zoom calls like today. Uh, you're emailing people. Uh, you might be messaging people, you know, via your phone, email. So there, it's more digital, virtual, uh, different. You're not face to face anymore like you were when you were in your classroom. So communication is very different than it is when in person. And we're going to talk about that in a moment. But first, what I wanted to start off with is a poll. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen in a second and bring the poll up. But I'd like you to go to pollev.com slash my name, Laura Plinus 701. And these are the three questions that are going to pop up shortly that I'd like to kind of learn from you, like what, how you feel right now about your communication. So let me share that. All right, let's see if I can activate it. Activate, present, all right, there we go. So again, you should see at the top, you can also text. So to seven, uh, 37607, um, my name, Laura Plinus, 701, um, Laura, L-A-U-R-A, Plinus, P-L-E-I-N-E-S, and 701 to join. And you should see the first question up. So are you confident that your written verbal communication is clear and concise? So I'm looking for strongly agree, agree, disagree, and strongly disagree for some reason. Oh, there we go. I'm like, why is it cut off? So if you could respond, and I just want to see how you feel about your communication. Is it short and concise? Are you confident you can be short and concise when you're writing something, when you're verbally communicating with someone? Laura, if students are having a hard time joining, do, would you want them just to use numbers in the chat or would that work? Yeah, hold on, let me see what's going on with this. It should be active, activate. Go to the next one, activate. All right, let's try that. And so they would just text that number Yes, and I, I just did it myself and it doesn't seem to be coming up. So let's do that. Um, let me, sorry about that. No, pro no problem. Of course, technology doesn't always want to work. So let's do this. In the chat, if you strongly agree, go ahead and type that. If you agree, disagree, 
or strongly disagree with the first question. You can do it directly to me or to everyone. So are you confident that your written and verbal communication is clear and concise? So I've got agree. So a lot of people agree. They don't feel strongly that they can be clear and concise, but you know, they, they feel they go in that direction. And we had someone kind of, a few other people kind of disagree. They're not as confident. They can be so clear and concise in what they communicate. Perfect, thank you. So for the next question, are you confident that you're sharing the most, inform most important information when you communicate? So again, just type, type directly in the chat to me uh, where you fit along that. Do you agree? I've seen some agrees. All right, so I, th I think everyone feels they are sharing the most important information. Someone somewhat agrees. I should have added that in as an option. Because maybe sometimes you do it, but then sometimes it depends on the information you need to share. Do you think it's important, but maybe your audience doesn't? And we'll talk about that. So let's get into audience. Are you confident that you're engaging your audience with your communication? So, you know, are you getting their attention? Do you think they understand what you're trying to say? Oh, so I'm seeing a lot of disagrees. People are struggling probably with trying to understand how to engage your audience. All right, so a lot of disagrees. And we're gonna talk about, so we're gonna explore what it means to be clear and concise in your communication. What it means to understand what you need to communicate, what's most important to the audience. And then obviously, how do you get your audience's attention? So my goal today for you is what you will learn today to improve your communication. And I talk about it verbal and written is first, we're gonna explore how do you understand your audience? So understanding the styles of communication. And one trend you're seeing now in communication is a lot of use of pronouns. Um, so understanding that. So I'm gonna share with you kind of what are the pronouns commonly used? It's one way people use to communicate and identify who they are. So we'll talk about that. Also focusing on your language. So it's talking about the tone of your voice. And it's not, you know, are you being too loud? Do you sound mean? It's how you come across sometimes, what meaning those words are giving to someone who's interpreting your message. Also understanding your body language, so nonverbals. Because you could say one thing, but if your body doesn't match that, it's conflicting to people and could tell a different story. It could communicate something very differently. We're also gonna talk about how you compose a message, how you really communicate, thinking about what's the goal, you know, the present situation, what do people know about what you're gonna tell them and what steps you take to really help them understand what your message. And then also when to use what to communicate. So th this is channels. So it's when, you know, do you pick up the phone, when do you email someone? And right now you're dealing with asynchronous and synchronous communication. And there's another term that's connected to that, which is information richness. So I'm gonna explain that a little bit and we'll have an activity at the end. If you have any questions, you know, I'm happy for you to come off mute as I present or, you know, message me in the chat or message everyone. Um, even if you have any comments or agree with something, you know, or even reactions, please go ahead and use the chat and the reactions. I wanna make this very, um, you know, two-way engaging for you. All right, so let's first talk about understanding your audience. So typical audiences in the style of your communication. So for you, I have professors here, but it might be your teachers. Um, so think of that in that light. So first, let's talk about family and friends. You have family and friends that you communicate with, probably. Then you have your teachers, and possibly if you have a job or going to get a job, or even when you go off to college, you're going to have professors and employers. And then when you're, you know, on the job, you're going to have colleagues. And the different levels of how you communicate with them vary. And so I use this um, image because you think of when someone's talking about how you dress for a situation so you always hear like business casual so that doesn't mean like a suit and tie um, it might be you know different colors something very simple but 
when it's cocktail attire or business attire, you're very much like matching. You have like a very nice suit. And then as you can see, the form of, um, you know, being formal, that scale gets, you know, very, very formal to tuxedo, black tie, white tie. But then you have the other end where, you know, casual, someone's wearing shorts or smart casual. It might be maybe your Sunday best when you go to church, what you wear, um, where business casual and business attire are typically on the job. And I think business attire, I would see more as if you're doing an interview. So for me, when you're communicating with your friends and family, it's casual. It doesn't need to be formal. You probably have language that you and your friends and your family understand. You use the same words. But then when you get to talking to like a teacher, a professor, and maybe in college, your employer, so your boss, it's going to be more formal. It's going to be that business attire where it's writing a, you know, a formal email letter. You're because you don't know your audience that well. You don't know what style of communication they're receptive to. And then your colleagues can be a mixture of formal and casual too. So it might be you, as you get to know your colleagues, the people that you work with on the job, you'll know like how they prefer to be communicated with um, and what types of words to use. But when you first meet them, you have to really work to develop that relationship to understand how you communicate to them. So that's what you need to keep in mind when you want to understand your audiences the relationship you have with that audience. How well do they know you? How well do you know them? You know, are there words or there is there a language that you understand? Then it's also demographics. And when I say demographics, I'm meaning, you know, their age, you know, what race they're, they are. Maybe you might know their religion. What groups are they affiliated with? And then the purpose. So it's, what are you trying to get them to do? Why are you communicating with them? And, you know, what, how will they be receptive? So if you think of, say, you're trying to get a job and you want to communicate to a recruiter who's going, you're hoping will hire you. So you don't really have a relationship with this person. So you want to make it formal because you don't know how they would like to receive communication, their style. Uh, you might not even know, like, who they are. You might not know if they're a man or a female, and we're going to talk about demographics. So maybe you just know their name. So you stick to using their name when you communicate to them, say you're emailing them. And then obviously your purpose, like being clear, like I'm interested in this position you have available. I'd like to know, you know, more about it, the recruitment process. Here's why I feel I, you know, can, I'm the best fit for this role and would love, to, you know, to be part of the hiring process. So that's just an example of thinking. And I think it goes back to looking at this chart here and this image when you think of, you know, what to dress when and how that formality there, the same can be said for communication. So when I talked about relationships, I also mentioned pronouns with sometimes you don't always know if you're talking to someone who's a female or a male. So it's always good to try and use the person's name, but if you want to use gender pronouns in place of someone's name, this chart kind of explains what to use. Um, but there are a lot of people today that do not want to ha have um, be called she, he. So I think it, yeah, it is coming up. So I put next to my name on Zoom and in my email signature that I am fine being called she, her, and hers. And I could even get herself on there as well. So you see that now in people's email signatures, maybe next to their name on Zoom, that they share what their pronouns are. So people know what you could be called by beyond your name. So for me, my suggestion is always use that person's name if you don't know what pronouns they prefer to be called by. You could ask them um, if you're emailing them and you're not sure. If you see them face to face sometimes, maybe over Zoom, it may, may not always be clear because now a lot of people do not want to be stuck to a certain gender pronoun. They'd rather be called they, them, theirs, or their. So keep that in mind as well. And you can see here the different forms of pronouns, you know, beyond she, he, and they. 
And it's one thing as a communicator, I remind people sometimes when they do instructions and they refer to a person and they want to use pronouns, typically you would see people use she, he, but today I say to them, you need to use they, because not everyone is, you know, set to using a specific gender and want that binary, which is very generalized and not stuck to a gender. So hopefully that makes sense. And I think, um, I know a lot of high schools uh, really promote you identifying what your gender is, your pronoun is when you introduce yourself. So saying your name and what pronouns you would like to be called by. Um, so just keep that in mind as well. All right, so let's talk about focusing on your language and tone of voice. So at my company, when we communicate to our employees via email, maybe video messages from our leaders, or even, um, you know, on our, we have a internet site, which is like an uh, internal website for just our employees where they can see news. Our focus is making it clear, concise, and authentic. Clear and concise meaning, and this was one of the questions that came up earlier, is being sure the audience understands what you're trying to say and that it's as short as possible. You're not adding in all these extra words. You want to keep it straight to the point. Because nowadays, you see with like Twitter and you only have like 120 some characters, people are consuming information, you know, in short snippets. They want to know like, why should I read more? Why should I click this link to read more? So it's when you're keeping things concise, you're being sure people are getting the most important information and what, you know, is important to them. So that's keeping the audience in mind. It's also being authentic. And when I say authentic, can anybody either in the chat or come off mute, tell me what they think that term means? What does it mean to be authentic? Anyone? Maybe real? Yeah, real. So it's, it's not hiding behind like corporate jargon. It's just sharing like who you are. So for me at the end of every email, I always say thanks. And that's kind of, everyone can always see that at the end of my emails, but my style of communication. Um, there's words and being your natural self is another thing someone brought up in the chat. So it's being sure that in your communication, you're still being yourself. You're not being a robot that you, you, your voice comes through. Can I ask a quick question here? So can I put a emoji smiley face as my, as part of my signature? Or is that too casual? Well, it depends on who your audience is. So if it's like a employer, maybe not, but if it's someone you work well with, I think that would be fine to have that in your signature when you say thanks. Um, and, and so I think it's, it can be a mix of, I think it's more casual than formal. Um, so I think it depends on your audience, but again, that's showing your authenticity. Um, so maybe it's someone you work with on a normal basis and you wanna share with them. Uh, and we'll talk about nonverbals, like emojis are a form of nonverbal sometimes, cause if you're writing something to someone, they can't see that you're smiling. But if you have a smiley face next to thanks or next to your name, they know you're smiling, you're happy. Um, and that's one thing sometimes you might lose in written communication, which we'll talk about later in the presentation, is that emotion. So the other thing to keep in mind with focusing on your language is you need to be sure you're making it meaningful and relevant. And that means thinking about what does this mean to my audience? Does this information make sense to them? Do they know what I'm talking about? And also, is it relevant to what they need to do right now? Are you asking them to take an action? So for instance, I'm um, doing a communication right now to my company that they need to take this training. Uh, and it's actually taught kind of relevant right now because it's talking about being safe when going back to the office. Um, so we're, we're still working virtually at our homes, but we're eventually going back to the office. So it's meaningful in it's preparing them to think about going back to the office and it's relevant because my company had just explained like what the next steps are. Uh, so it's being sure 
I could just put out, you need to take the safety training, but instead I'm saying, you know, per, you know, our recent communication about when we're going back to the office, we're providing this training to help you. So it's, it's being sure you're framing it and including words. So it makes sense. People know why I'm taking this changing or this training. And then the last thing is add little moments of wonder. What do you think I mean by that? What's a little moment of wonder? It has a bit of connection to authenticity. And it's another term for like surprising your audience. So what can they like take away? You know, is it the way you word something? Do you have like an interesting title? Say you're sending an email and there's a, a subject line and somebody actually asked, I just saw in the chat, how can this be translated when making or answering a company like organizational phone call? So if you're, you know, answering phone calls for your company and you want to be clear and concise and authentic, um, it could be, you know, the vocal variety you use since it's people can hear your voice. Do you sound like you have energy? Uh, are you using maybe less words and being sure you're hearing that person? So, you know, obviously you'll have a greeting. You ask that person, how can I help you today? Or what can I do for you today? Or I hope you're having a great day. Um, how can I help you more? Things like that. Uh, and that's almost like a little moment of wonder because you always hear that people, people answer the phone and be like, hi, this is so-and-so from whatever company how can I help you today? Well, instead of saying, how can I help you today? I'm here to assist you. Uh, please let me know, or please let me know how I can assist you today. Uh, and it depends. Maybe you're just routing people to where, um, you know, they can get assistance or they don't know where to go. Um, and this is like the main line they're calling and you'll direct them. So it's kind of adding in something maybe they don't hear as often because it's a typical kind of telemarketer call of, um, when someone, you know, picks up, answers the phone, if, if you're calling around like your credit card or, um, customer service you, for, uh, maybe something you recently bought that you're having trouble with, you hear kind of the same script. So it's, how do you get out of that script and personalize it with what, you know, so hopefully that was helpful Candace with your question. And hopefully everyone kind of understands with language, it's thinking about the tone. And, the, and when I say tone of voice, it's not just verbal, but also written, um, keeping it clear, concise, authentic, meaningful and relevant, and adding that moment of wonder. So surprising people doing something different. All right. So continuing when we talk about focusing on your language, I mentioned um, that it's also important to write more like you speak. So it's kind of cutting out that clutter, making it clear, thinking about when you have a conversation with someone, uh, maybe it's casual, and maybe when you go to email them, you still keep it casual. You don't have to make it as formal. And this maybe comes into play um, when you know we brought up the emojis and using it in um, you know an email signature, maybe with this friend that you're just emailing versus, you know, you just had a phone call, uh, uh, you know, in-person meeting, maybe you're just hanging out and then you recall, oh, I need to ask them this question and maybe you email them. Uh, and this is where you don't have to be as formal. You can still be casual, just like you had that in-person conversation that was casual. And that can be the same said for, you know, your colleagues down the road, when you develop relationships with people, say you have a, a Zoom meeting and you talk about something, a project you're working on, and then you follow up with an email. Again, the email can be per our conversation. Let me just outline the things we discussed, who is doing what within the project. So that would be what I would verbally like say to them, but I'm following it up to put it in writing in an email. So again, it's being sure you aren't sounding like a robot in your written communication and it's coming across your voice, who you are. So keep that in mind, right? More like you speak. So it might be if you write something, after you write it, walk away, come back and then look at it with fresh eyes and be sure, does this sound like myself? Read it out loud. Is this something I would verbally say? So just a few tips to keep in mind, you know, focusing on your language 
and writing more like you speak. All right, any questions? Thank you to those kind of posing in the chat as well and speaking up. So the next thing I wanna get a, a talk about is using body language and nonverbals. And I'm hoping, could someone come off mute and read this quote I have here? I might pick someone. If a person words fail to match the, I can't really see what it says. Nonverbal cues, it best use the nonverbal messages. Yes, you had it. Thank you. So if a person's words fail to match their nonverbal cues, it's best to trust the nonverbal messages. So for instance, say I'm saying I'm really happy to be here today. So I'm saying I'm happy, but did I just look like I was happy and did it sound like I was kind of happy? No. So again, you need to make it so what you're saying, which it's true. I actually am happy to be here today and talked with everyone. So I've got a smile on my face. You hear the energy in my voice. Uh, so it's matching what I'm saying. So nonverbals help with repetition. So using gestures. So you see a lot of people, sometimes they talk with their hands a bit. I don't do it as much, but sometimes that shows people's energy and maybe they're, they're pointing out something. Nonverbals also help with substituting. So sometimes it's, um, instead of saying I'm happy, you can just see I'm smiling. So obviously she's excited to be here. She doesn't need to tell us that she's excited to be here and it compliments. So again, if I say I'm happy to be here and I'm smiling or seem enthusiastic, you know, it compliments what I'm saying. Um, accenting, so a strong tone of voice to, to dramatize certain words or messages. So the quote, when I was reading it out loud, I try to use a different type of tone of voice because um, it's something someone said, not my own words. So it's, it's changing how the message is coming across. And then nonverbals can be misleading or deceiving, which I just mentioned with giving you the example of I'm happy to be here today and not look happy, not smile. So keep that in mind. And how you can improve your nonverbals is watch yourself and others. Uh, so it's kind of hard with Zoom because you've got all of, you can see people from like the chest up. Um, but your virtual backgrounds, and I had said to um, Ananike, should I change my virtual background? And as you can see, I made signs in the background that say um, work hard. Um, at, well, yeah, it's work hard and make it happen. So it's in my office. It's my reminder of you got to work hard. And, and, you know, when you do that, you'll make it happen. Uh, so it's kind of in my Zoom always for people to see. But sometimes I might add a Zoom background um, depending on the conversation. I teach a class at Towson University. And sometimes I'll have actually Towson in the background um, while we're, you know, in a virtual Zoom environment. So it's thinking of, you know, what's your background like? So setting your stage, your environment, because that's one way people can learn more about you and it, it impacts how you communicate. The other thing is maintaining eye contact. So for me right now, I'm looking right into the camera um, and I'm also looking at my PowerPoint screen. So I can't see all of your faces, but I'm hoping, you know, looking at that green light, that's my camera, you know, I'm trying to look at you, you know, pay attention to you. I'm not like looking off to the side, not paying attention. And that's the same, you know, when you give presentations, you might see people not maintaining eye contact, not looking at the screen. So it's like, are they paying attention to me? Obviously in person, eye contact's easy to do because uh, you're face to face. But again, if you're talking to a large audience, you kind of have to scan and look around. So in a virtual environment, it's different. It's also another thing is work on your posture, sit up straight. Be sure you have a chair that has a back, your feet are on the floor because you can see if you're slouching down. Um, and you know, I talked about this, read your audience. You know, do they seem engaged? Are they responding to you? Can you see them and, you know, see if they're paying attention? And then also listen to your own voice. When I first 
did public speaking, I could notice when I got nervous, my voice would crack up. Uh, so it's again, being sure I'm working hard to, to feel confident. So that's not happening. Uh, and it's also thinking about, am I sounding very monotone? Am I speaking too fast? Am I speaking too slow? So it's thinking about those things because it's not always what you say, but how you say it. So keep that in mind as well. Not what you say, but how you say it and how you say it connects to your body language and your nonverbals. So I hope those tips are helpful. And definitely now in a Zoom environment, virtual, it is different, it, it is weird. But always I say to people, think about your background, maybe use a virtual background if you're on Zoom and look at that camera directly, that green light. So the other thing I wanted to talk about is when you communicate where it be verbal or be written, you really have to think about like the message you're composing. And there's this gentleman, he's actually based in Toronto, Canada, and I'm just gonna pull this out. There it is, it should have come up first, uh, is he owns a company called Think Outside the Slide. So he works on presentations and PowerPoint tips. And you can visit his website at thinkoutsidetheslide.com. If you're ever planning to put together a PowerPoint presentation, he has tips and tricks when it comes to, uh, you know, putting charts in, using data, and really thinking about the, you know, it shouldn't be death by PowerPoint. You should really focus on your PowerPoint presentation aiding what you're verbally saying. So it's not word for word. It's more complimenting what is set, being said. So for him, he believes your message should have a goal, a present situation, and follow steps. So the goal of your presentation, you, you have to think, and it's almost so it, GPS, it's like a global positioning system. So it's what you use, you know, you have it on your phone, maybe it's Google Maps where you need instructions and you're at home and maybe you need to go, you have an interview with an employer that's in downtown Baltimore. So you first figure out, okay, point one, which here, let me back this up. So point one, what I just was highlighted in red, what do you want the audience to agree to approve or understand? So on this map, it's the destination, it's where you wanna go. So that's the goal. And then your starting point is, well, where's the audience now? So that's where you start. Uh, and then the, the steps are, well, what content and in what order do you need to move them to that destination? So I think about it this way. So say you are presenting on um, Easter, the holiday that just happened. So talking about the Christian traditions of Easter. So maybe your goal is to be sure that everyone kind of understands, you know, what Easter is, how it's celebrated in the Christian faith. So the first where you'd start the present situation is, well, where's your audience now? you know, are people Christians? Maybe they aren't. Do they practice a religion? Are they not religious? So once you have that information, then you can figure out, all right, this is what I need to explain to them. If you're talking to someone who's a Christian already, maybe it's thinking, well, what's not well known about the holiday? Or if you're speaking to people who, you know, have know nothing, then you really have to kind of share information that is simple, that, you know, kind of helps outline what it is. So hopefully that example was helpful and, it, you know, thinking differently. So think of when you're communicating something with someone where it be a presentation or even something you're writing, what's the goal? Then think, all right, well, what do they know right now, the present situation? And then think of steps. So what information do I need to share with them so then I can get them to my goal? Any questions? All right, so I wanna share this video with you. It was done by a professor at a university and it came out during you know, the start of the pandemic when synchronous and asynchronous communication was happening. People were are working from home. You're you know, going to school at home and it's really understanding, well, what channel do I use when I wanna communicate with what? So let's watch this. Thank you. 
We live in an era of constant digital communication. With the tap of a button, we can share insights and collaborate with people all over the world. But there's a cost. We can easily get distracted and lose our focus. This is why quality communication requires intentionality. And it helps to think about the distinction between synchronous and asynchronous communication tools. Synchronous communication happens in real time, in the moment. By contrast, asynchronous communication can happen over a longer period of time. Synchronous communication might be a video conference, a live chat, or a phone call. Asynchronous communication might be a pre-recorded video, an audio message, or an email. Both synchronous and asynchronous communication have their distinct advantages and disadvantages. Synchronous communication is faster and more dynamic. It's great for active participation in interactive discussions. It tends to work well with smaller groups, but it can lead to frequent interruptions and distractions that get in the way of deep work. With asynchronous communication, there's no need to schedule, which means you can go at your own pace with fewer disruptions. Asynchronous communication works well when the internet connection is unstable or when participants are in different time zones. It also tends to allow for a permanent record of your communication. However, asynchronous communication doesn't work well when you need to address issues in the moment and it can feel less interactive. Some communication platforms blend together synchronous and asynchronous components. A walkie-talkie app lets you communicate in the moment but listen later and even adjust the speed. A shared document has real-time edits but the comments are asynchronous and there is a permanent record of all annotations. Video chats can occur in real time, but then recorded for replay later on. This can help increase accessibility. Meanwhile, social media platforms often blend together live and recorded videos, chats, and updates. Both synchronous and asynchronous communication are necessary for collaborative work. This is why teams should think strategically about when to use both types of communication as they plan for collaborative projects. And educators should be intentional about how they use both approaches to improve student collaboration as well. Hey, thank you for watching this video. Would you do me a favor? If you enjoy this video, would you click on the like button and consider subscribing to this channel? All right. So right now, what are, oh, don't want to watch this again. Right now, wh what kind of communication are we doing? Is it synchronous or asynchronous? So you can come off mute or post in the chat. Are we synchronous right now or are we asynchronous? Synchronous, thank you. Yep, synchronous, yep. So being on Zoom, um, this, you're here live, you can chat, you can come off mute. Uh, and it actually kind of fits when you were looking at the Venn diagram versus synchronous and asynchronous. It fits in the middle because it's being recorded and someone can watch it later. So it's very interesting to see how our world has tried to find that blend um, and how information is shared can be a, a mixture and everyone has their preference. And there's this term called information risk richness. It's defined as the ability of an information exchange to change someone's understanding effectively with where it's communicated to be understood. So I know that's a mouthful, but it's basically saying people will gain more from what you're saying to them when, depending on how, you know, the channel you're using. So for instance, a face-to-face -face conversation where maybe you're sitting at a Starbucks outside um, and you're talking with someone, that has high information richness. People can see you, they can see your facial reactions, they can hear you, they can be in the moment. Um, and video conferencing is also that way because you can we can see each other. You can see our facial expressions. You can hear us clearly. The, the telephone conversation, that does have high information richness. Um, people can understand you better. But the one thing it lacks is you can't see people. So it goes back to the nonverbals. They might sound excited. They might be saying things that make it seem excited. But their face might be saying something else. So they're lying to you, but yet what you hear 
and the words they're using say a different message. And then that's where you get to like emails, you talk about phones, uh, blogs, written letters and memos. They're medium when it comes to information richness because you can't always tell people's emotions uh, or they might, the, the choice of words they use might confuse you. You might not fully understand what they're asking for. It's also sometimes people might use slang that isn't common for you. So for instance, I have um, coworkers in the UK and I have to sometimes watch the slang I use because what it means here in the US is could be different in the UK and vice versa. They may say things and I'm not sure what that means. Um, so malarkey is a word, which just means something that's not great. Um, and I've, because I hear it all the time, I start using it to people who aren't used to speaking to someone who's, you know, British and in the UK and use it all the time. Uh, so that's the issue with information richness and especially with written communication is sometimes you might use terms, words, even have certain emotions that don't come across clearly. And then low information richness is when you get into written documents and spreadsheets. Uh, Cause sometimes that isn't always clear. You're not, you're just getting information. It might be more information than you need. It might be hard to understand. It may not even be meant for you. Um, so you, you think of um, FAQs, um, it, you know, if you're working with data, you have all this data and you don't really know what it means. So it's kind of interesting how in the digital world, video conferencing has replaced the face-to-face -face communication. And sometimes it is kind of hard to still understand, even though it's high, it's still hard sometimes to, uh, to get the information you need. Um, but keep this in mind, depending on, you know, who you're communicating with, what you want to communicate with them, how it will be perceived, you know, will people get enough information from it? So what I'd like to do is practice with you um, on, you know, everything I talked about. So we talked about language. We talked a bit, nonverbals don't come into play here, but we talked about composing a message, information richness, tone of voice. So I have this email here and it's to Michaela Cook and the subject is performance review. And could I have someone read off to me what this email says? Marquita, if you're still there, could you read this off for us? The due date for a performance review is near and our documents show that you have. Uh-oh, we lost Joe. I'll finish it up. So our documents show that you have not completed the required information. Please do so as soon as possible, HR. And the line is, you know, at the top says, dear colleague. So say you're Michaela's boss and you wanna get her attention. And a performance review is pretty much reviewing your work at your job. And sometimes it means you'll get a pay increase. Uh, and there's information here missing that maybe could be made up or added. So what I'd like you to do, and I'll play a little music in the background, but on your own, if you could take some time with maybe a piece of paper, think, how would you rewrite this? You're Michaela's boss. You're writing to her about the performance review. How can you be clear and concise? Maybe use your own tone of voice. What would you change about this? Would the subject line be different? Um, would the greeting be different? So go ahead and take a few minutes. And if you have any questions, just uh, chat to me and let me. Told them your dreams and they all stop. Okay, 
some calming music. Take a few more minutes and then we'll talk about what you've changed about this email. Right. So let's walk through this email. So the subject, what did anyone change the subject of the email? And if you did, what did you change it to? And you can come off mute, you could chat to me. What if you change the subject, what does it now say for your email? Did you keep performance review or did you add something else to get their attention, to open that email? I added um, urgent and then the date. Yeah, so uh, urgent performance review, maybe you put it as when it's due. Or urgent, please open about your performance review. Or it could even be action. Um, cause when people see an action, it means, oh, there's something I need to do. So as far as the greeting right now, it says, dear colleague, what else could it be? Did anyone change it? And thinking, you know, this person, they're an employee of yours. So do you need to say dear colleague? 
Could you call Michaela by her name? Could you say, hi, Michaela, dear Michaela? Yeah, that, that makes it more formal was another suggestion someone said. You could even just say, hi, Michaela. Because again, colleague, you don't, you probably have a relationship with, you don't have to make it so formal. So as far as the body of the message, what information uh, did you reword or think to include? Was there something missing that should have been in there that you thought, well, let me just add this, or I didn't like the way this sounded, I wanted to change it to this. So it mentioned the due date for the performance review is near, but it doesn't say when. I'm emailing you to let you know that your performance review is due. You don't even, I like that, but you don't even have to say I'm e emailing you. Um, you could just clearly say, keeping it short and concise, I want to let you know that your performance review is due by this date and you haven't completed it yet. So keeping it short and concise. And then instead of saying, please do so as soon as possible, if you know where they need to complete it, maybe you tell them, here's the system you need to complete it in and the link to go there. The other thing you could add is, if there's a consequence, like what if she doesn't complete this? And it typically at corporations, if you don't com complete your part of the performance review, you don't get a pay raise. Uh, so you could even add that in there if you the consequence for not completing it. So let me move to my example. So my example is, hi, Michaela. Or so the 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 subject is for action. Complete your performance review by Friday, August eighteenth. Then it's hi, Michaela. This is just a quick reminder that you haven't filled out your performance review form yet. The deadline approaching is the deadline's approaching fast. Please complete this in Workday. Link to the instructions in Workday is a system where this could be completed in. Again, reminds the date by Friday, August eighteenth. Otherwise, you'll miss out on that pay raise. And then they put their name. So Michaela's boss is Jane. So you see, I've mentioned to you, typically you communicate with someone because you want them to do something. You want to have an, an action in there. So obviously you have in the subject, there's an action for action. You need to do this. Read this email. So like I mentioned, titles sometimes, you know, not trying to grab people's attention. You add things like this. It will get your attention. I, I'd open an email if someone told me I had an action. And then also seeing the consequence, so understanding well, why you need to do this, when you need to do this, where you need to do this. Uh, so what is the performance review? You see that highlighted. Where is in work day? When is the Friday, August 18th? And the why, you know, you'll miss out of a pay raise. So really different um, ways to look at a message. And everyone adds their own personal style to things, but it's thinking, how do you get people's attention? Keeping it short and concise, being true to who you are, so that authenticity. And I think that moment of wonder was you add at the end, well, if you don't do it, you're not getting that pay raise. And I think everyone wants a pay raise. So, you know, entices them to take care of it. So with that, I'm going to open it up to if you have any questions and if there's anything I can ever do for you to help you with your communication, uh, my email's there. It's lplinus, L-P-L-E-I-N-E-S at Sienna.com. And then you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm Laura M. Plinus, P-L-E-I-N-E-S. So love to connect with you if you're on LinkedIn. It's a great source for, you know, if you're thinking about going into college, looking for a job. It's a great area to network and see what's out there. So it's kind of the professional version of a Facebook or Instagram. So I'll open up if you have a question in the chat or if you want to come off mute. So Laura, when we're thinking about like customer service, right? Any like tips in, in terms of engaging your customers or just giving that winning customer service experience? So I think it's like I had mentioned earlier, they hear the same script all the time. Like, how may I help you? So it's how do, and I, you think of like Chick-fil-A um, and they're always like, after you go, it's been a pleasure to serve you. That's like their signature line. So you always expect it from them. Um, so how do you sh share a bit of yourself where, you know, if you interact with the same customer, they'll always expect the, the same style of communication. Um, or it's how do you 
shock them, you know, saying something that's different than the script, still helping them. Um, and I think it's, again, you may not know who you're speaking to. So it goes back to, you know, being sure you talk, speak to them with, by their name, if you get their name. Um, you may be just using regular pronouns like you, how can I help you? Um, cause you don't want to say he, she, cause you don't know around, you know, the pronouns. And I think it's keeping it short and concise. And, and the other thing I didn't cover here is a lot of, a big part of communication is listening. So it's really listening to that person and, you know, do they have a question around something? Is it a complaint? Um, and a lot of times you're going to hear complaints. So how do you, you know, in your voice, maybe energize, maybe the words you use, um, really be sure you're picking a message where it's going to keep that person engaged. They're going to be able to understand the information you're sharing with them. Um, and I think in customer service, it's you're at, you're fixing a problem or getting them information you need. So any other questions? And I think my tip for you is Again, in the Zoom world and the digital world, it's really thinking, you know, how you show up on Zoom with your, your camera on, looking at the camera, your background, is it virtual? You know, what kind of background do you have where you're, you're at? It's being sure you are making that eye contact. You're being clear and concise when you're verbally communicating. Uh, thinking of your presentations, keeping them simple, very visual, pleasing, finding ways to engage. So I use the chat today. I tried to do the poll. It didn't work out. Um, but finding ways where, you know, I had people, I called on people to kind of read out a few things. Uh, so keeping that engagement. And I think in your written communication, it's, you know, when does it make sense to pick up the phone and call someone for, or get on a Zoom call versus email or texting them? you know, thinking about, you know, how much information richness they're going to get, you know, getting your message across and being sure they understand it. It's clear they get the whole message. So just a few tips um, to keep in mind. So Laura, just one thing really quickly, do you mind going back to the email slide? Sure. Um, and I think if you wouldn't mind just highlighting like the key areas, right? Because I know sometimes um, we get emails where we don't have a subject line, we don't have a body, but like maybe we could point out like some key factors when you're emailing, whether it's formal or casual, just things to make sure that you're including when you're communicating via email. Yeah. So the subject line is clear on what this email is about. What am I getting ready to read? I think if you're emailing one person, it's being sure you say their name hello, hi, it's having that initial greeting. It's not a text message where you're just like, blah, 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 you're just sending the message. It's saying hi. And then maybe some people would be like, hi. Oh, sorry, it went, went too far. Instead of saying like, hi, how are you? People don't have time for those formal greetings unless it's someone you haven't talked to in a while or you have a relationship with. So it's being sure that first sentence people know what's happening and it's clear here, you know, the performance review is due. It's coming up. You need to take care of this. And then it's sharing the where you're going to do it, when it needs to be done and why. So it's being sure you think of the, the W's and, and how, so it, it might even be like, you know, am I saying like what needs to happen? Am I explaining where? And when do they have why and do they know how to do it? And in the email subject, this is kind of long. So it could be for action, performance review due um, August 18th. Again, very simple. Uh, and I think in emails, you want to be sure you have a closing. So having your name. I think what's missing here is it could have said thanks. Or if you have any questions, reach out to me. Um, and then obviously some people have email signatures, which is their full name, their job title, you know, how you contact them. It's their email address, their phone number. Um, typically, if I'm emailing someone casually or my personal email about something, you know, I want to be sure the subject line they understand. I'm, I say hello, whoever they are. I'm making that email very short and concise and clear of 
why I'm reaching out to you, what I need from you, um, thanking them at the end. And then in my greeting, being sure they know what my email is and even my phone number. Uh, Cause some people might prefer to call me and I, and that's fine. So, you know, providing that information signals to people, there's options to get back to you. And the other thing is sometimes you might need to say to someone, can you please get back to me by this date? Or I need to know this by this time. So it's giving them a deadline. Um, and even sometimes in emails, you can tag an email. So it gives this person a reminder that they need to do something by a certain date. So again, in constructing an email, it's thinking, how do you personalize it? How do you get someone's attention with that subject line? Do they know why they're opening this email? What's in here? And what's in it for me? And that's where the, this why comes in. Like, if you don't do this, you're not going to get a pay raise. So it's making this person take action and take it by the date or there's a consequence. So hopefully that's helpful in you thinking, you know, when you're doing email communication, what's important. And for me, it's always thinking, who am I emailing? What do they need to know? Why do they need to know it? What are they going to do? And how am I persuading them in a sense to do it? What language am I using? What words am I using that is going to get the reaction I want? So hopefully that was helpful. That was really helpful. Thank you so much. Yeah. And Laura, I know that we've taken two minutes over, two minutes extra of your time. And I just want to say thank you so much. I'm so happy that we were able to record it because last time I forgot, but we have this on file um, and we will be putting, pulling together a lesson plan so that teachers can use this kind of content um, to help um, our young people as they work on and, and strengthening their communication verbal and nonverbal. Um, so definitely thank you for taking the time out of your day um, to connect with us. Um, do you mind putting your email in the chat and your sure, LinkedIn yeah. profile? So if any student wants to connect with you on LinkedIn um, or reach out to learn about like your career journey yeah, of course. Um, or communication willing. tips. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd be willing to reach out to everyone and thank you for joining today. It was, and for, for those who participated, I appreciate it. Um, cause like I said, I don't always want it to be me. Um, and I'm trying to pull up my LinkedIn link and it's taking forever, but my full name, um, so you can search for it right on LinkedIn. Thank you so much. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great one. And thank you everyone for joining today. Um, I put the exit survey in the chat box. So please give us your feedback because um, we, we, we are building out our programming for next school year. And Laura will talk, hopefully you'll come back and join us. Um, and then um, we have a careers in a STEM and healthcare event on Friday that you don't want to miss. It's from nine to 12 and the link to register and get the Zoom links for that event is in the chat as well. So really excited um, for some of the upcoming opportunities to engage with you. And Laura, just thank you again. And thank you for all that you do for our young people and have a great day. Thanks. Thanks. Bye everyone. Bye. <laughs>